Shalom. This is Bishop Nathaniel of Israel United in Christ. I want to start off by saying thank you to all of our Booster Club members for your many donations and much more your prayers. We visited faraway countries and strange lands. We've even spoken to dignitaries and were detained for spreading the glorious gospel in Cuba. The truth is that the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel were scattered throughout the world. Help us on our journey as we continue to raise up the nation of Israel. 12 tribes worldwide. Join or donate today. Shalom. Uh, it's been in my spirit for a while to do something that deals with the tongue and how we speak, but I want to do a comprehensive class on it. Um, so I'll, that's why I say it might be a two-parter. If I could do two parts, it'll be comprehensive. If not, it'll just be today and it'll be a concise class. All right? That's what concise, comprehensive. All right. Um, let's start with Exodus 4 and 10. Because some of you don't know how to talk to people. Some of you ain't never dealt with people, right? Some of you don't realize it shouldn't, we should speak well and proper all the time. And I don't mean as far as being nitpicky of proper grammar and stuff, right? I mean, we shouldn't sound uneducated. But there's a lot of considerations in how we speak, how we speak around our children. Because some of you come here and y'all speak fine, and then at home y'all speaking all thugged out. And then you wonder why your kids is coming here speaking all crazy, right? It's like, that's, that's what they hear around, right? I tell you, I, I study Esau sometimes, man. And when I used to uh, work in some very, uh, where, where, was, where did the Clintons live in, in Westchester County? Chappaqua. When I used to work in Chappaqua in New York, right, is where the Clintons lived. They had a house there. Uh, I was a dental hygienist there. And it was a very, you know, bougie office, right? Um, and uh, I used to hear the Edomites speak to their kids and how they speak to them and stuff. And then, it, like, it would get in my head, like, gosh, I was like, we're usually, uh, one of the big things about us is we tend to be very dismissive with the kids, right? Like, uh, I, I always, I've, I've probably used this example in different contexts, but one really stood out to me. There was, there was something going on, like, in Curacao or, I don't know, someplace like that. And um, the, the little eat of my kid was asking the mother, like, oh, you know, well, what's that? And I'm like, you know. If this was a Jake parent, they probably would have been like, uh, mind your business, or you don't need to know about that, or you know, here's some candy, or whatever, whatever it is that we did to direct. She actually sat down and showed him where Curacao was and what was going on. Now, kid's seven. He don't know that there's conflict because of overthrowing governments or whatever. And maybe it opens up the door to more questions. Maybe it doesn't. But I said, gosh, I said, if we only dealt with our children that way when they ask us, and trust me, I know we busy, right? So sometimes it's hard not to be dismissive, right? Like my daughter will come with like a thousand questions sometimes, and I'm like, goodness. I'm like, but then I got to remind myself, like, hey, this is the type of stuff that builds them to be ready for the world, right? They ain't always going to be with me. I know what's out there, right? So that's a, an example of speech, right? Sometimes we, we don't speak well in the home, right? But Lord's will will be able to encompass many aspects of it. The main thing that I want to get out today is us really acknowledging and owning if you're slow of speech, right? And uh, let's read the scripture and go from there. So Exodus 4 and 10. The book of Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servants, but I am slow of speech and slow of a tongue. So he says to the Most High, he goes, hey, I am not eloquent neither here to for. There's levels of speech, and I'm not saying everybody needs to speak eloquently, right? But we need to be able to work on our speech, especially when it comes to how we speak with each other in this walk, and be conscious of it in general, because you say a lot, when you're speaking, even if you're not addressing a specific topic or a specific thing. Like, I like to listen to people talk sometimes just because you can learn a lot about them. And again, I'm not talking about your grammar and how you announce words and pronounce things, enunciation and all that stuff. I'm just talking about you just got to kind of listen to the way people speak. And we don't consider, right? Some of y'all can't speak well and you don't have any humility to know this. 
Or you're just evil and you don't care and you don't want to adjust it. But I'm going to show you how biblically that's off, that we need to be able to work on our speech, right? So he says, he called it slow of speech and slow of tongue. Christians will say he stuttered. That means he stuttered. Moses had a stutter, and this is why he said what he said in verse 11. That's not true, by the way, but this is what Christianity would teach you. Come on. Verse 11, and the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb or deaf, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Right? So the Most High is letting you know, whatever your level of speaking is at, I have the power to change it for the better or for the worse. Right? So this is why I say you have to have the humility to be able to identify if you don't speak well, if you're slow of speech, right? If you're slow of tongue, right? And look for the cues biblically so that you can work on that and become better in your speech, right? Go ahead, read on. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So God does this, and he will make those he chooses to better speakers. So this is something that many of us, once you find out if you're not a good speaker, and let me tell you something. A lot of people have tell me, they're like, oh, you know, you speak so eloquently, you speak so this, that, and that. And it's maybe because of vocabulary or whatever it is. Um, and even I was getting cut doing this class because there's context, there's time, and how you do that stuff. So it's, it, it, remember, it's not about speaking with big words, so to speak, right? And you've heard the thing, there's no such thing as big words, just little brains. Right? Oh, so it's not about the type of words you use as far as an extensive vocabulary, but there's tone, there's context. I've said this before, who you are speaks so loudly I can't hear what you're saying, right? So how you present it. You could be telling me something speaking just well, and then the way it's brought out and how it's done. And we're going to cover all those bases today, Lord's will, right? So... God is the one that has the power to do this, right? And, and understand, slow of speech, it, yes, it could encompass stuttering, but think about Moses. They said he was learned in all the way of the Egyptians. You don't think that if he had a stuttering problem, they would have addressed it? They tried to make it seem like he was some hick that never spoke. They said he was knowledgeable in all the ways of Egypt. And all you former Egyptologists and comedics, right, you understand that the Egyptians, for as much as they were our oppressors, they had a lot of knowledge and understanding, right? There's a lot of things that, it, that nobody can dispute that, but that knowledge is more earthly, right? Because they didn't have the true understanding of the power of the Most High. That's the best knowledge. That's the thing that destroys all the other knowledge. But from a context, from a worldly perspective, the Egyptians were great. They were ruling power. They had us in captivity. They had lots of understanding on different things of what they were supposed to have understanding on, right? Like when you read in Deuteronomy and it says the stars and the animals, that was for them, not for our people. Let's get Sirach 6 and 32. Sirach 6 and 32. The book of Sirach, chapter 6 and verse 32. My son, if thou wilt, thou shalt be taught. And if thou wilt apply thy mind, thou shalt be prudent. Now, look up the definition of prudent for me while I go over this, all right? So it says, my son, if thou wilt, thou shalt be taught. So you must have a willing spirit. Don't lay on the excuse of what I just said that God determines them. Well, this is what God gave me. Right? If you will, if you have a willing spirit to learn, right? So your first step is having the humility to realize that. Moses knew. He said, hey, man, I'm not a good speaker, right? I mean, he knows stuff, but he's just, I'm just not, I'm not the one to really do this sort of thing. And then the most I blasted him, and he was like, listen, yeah, you know, because he was like, oh, get Aaron. Like, when you read on, and he was like, bro, if I wanted Aaron, I would have chose Aaron. I'm telling you, you're going to one that's going to be the one to do this. But it says, if you're willing, if you have a willing spirit, that will be taught. Because scriptures on the tongue and being offensive and all this stuff come out all the time. And if you continually are an offender in this then it's you do not have a willing spirit, which as we continue to progress, you're going to wind up seeing, so the Bible is a heavy book and sin has so many levels, that by extension you have a sinful spirit, all right? And I'm going to bring the scriptures out to prove it. So it says, if thou wilt be taught, thou, sh uh, if thou, wilt, thou shalt be taught, and you must apply your mind, meaning there has to be a conscious effort to it, all right? Uh, see, I, I looked at my wife, so it popped into my head. When my wife and I have disputes, right, disagreements about things in the house, 
One of my biggest gripes with her is first acknowledging that she's wrong. Don't justify. Because usually, right, this is what women do, right? Well, I did this because you did that. Right, brothers? That's how they usually come. My world's no different. Don't let it fool you how we roll here. Not that I'm saying, not that I'm saying that it's fake. It's genuine how we are, right? We're able to kind of communicate well with each other. That's one thing. We communicate, right? There's no extended, well, she controls that because I just ignore her if she, and I'm good with that. Like, I'm so okay with that. Like, it doesn't bother me by any measure. So, so she has no leverage when it comes to that. She's the one that gets frustrated and says, damn it. And usually that's how she'll start it. I know if I don't talk to you, you're not going to say it to me. And then so she has to cave on that because I'm not. And I've, I'm, and I've told you this before. I'm not a jerk. I'm not walking around with a scowl on my face. I'm just regular. Like nothing ever happened. Hey, how you doing today? What's good? And then she's burnt because she's like, you know, there's an elephant in the room and I want to address it and I just don't see it. Right? Anyway, we have disputes, right? And one of my biggest pet peeves with her is that sometimes she'll be passive about it. And so the part here where it says, if thou will apply thy mind, I'm telling her, yeah, I understand that you have a lot going on, and this is why you might do this. And this. But that's why you have to apply your mind. It has to be in the forefront of your mind to want to change the behavior. So that's when I get angry when she says that, because that means it's not important enough to you. What I desire is not important enough to her to want to apply her mind to change it. Right? Yeah. Now, uh, this isn't about... Marriage, this is about my wife, this class. I'm just using that because I happened to look to her, and the Spirit said, use your wife as an example, Joshua. <laughs> That's not, it's not premeditated, right? Look, is that in my notes? What's my note for that, for that verse? Prudent defined. That's the only note I have for that verse, right? So, Spirit of the Lord told me to call you out, hon. All right. So, let's look up prudent real quick, right? Prudent. Acting with or showing care and thought for the future. So it's so appropriate with the example that I gave, understanding the definition of that, right? The scripture here says, thou shall be prudent if you want to learn, right? If you have a willing spirit, if you want to apply, you shall be prudent. Acting with or showing care and thought for the future. Okay, hon, I understand why you did that. I understand why you continue to do it. And if you know that that's the reason why you continue to do it, if you apply some prudence, you will offend less. And guess what will happen over time as you continue to apply that prudence? It'll become automatic, right? So prudence, and I've gone over a thing where we spoke about prudence and, and sagacity and everything like that, but in the context of us learning and dealing with speech, there has to be an effort too, right? Again, ultimately, it's of the Lord to what level you attain in that. But you have to be have a willing spirit to want to change it. And you have to apply it constantly. Meaning some of you are too quick to the trigger with your lips. Right? And your mouth being the trigger. It's like, and it comes out. So some, maybe the technique is, let me count to three. Right? Have you seen people do that? <sighs> Right? Or they'll rub the ears, right? That's the <laughs> right? What's it? Uh, anger management with Jack Nicholson? <laughs> he said, ooh, ooh, goose from, uh, goose from. <laughs> right? Whatever it is that gets you to pause your initial reaction, right? I, I read a book, uh, well, most of it. I didn't finish reading it. Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, by Dale Carnegie. Uh, some Edomite, some wealthy Edomite. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's actually an excellent book uh, for anybody who works in like social circles and things like that. Um, I still have it, I think. I have a paperback of it in my library. And um, the major premise of the book is um, you have to be able to be aware of how you speak to your audience, right? And not, I'm not talking about public speaking, but just um, things like remembering their name and saying their name back to them a lot when you speak to them, right? It, it, it subconsciously engages them more, little nuances and things like that, right? Um, but the point is, there's a whole book on it, and if you really think about it, the way you win friends and influence people is to be prudent, right? Taking thoughtful care in your speech. And many of us, because speaking, it wasn't always that way, right? We were at an age where we didn't know how to speak at all, form words. It's, it's one of those things we just do so much it's like that you're on autopilot with it, right? Just like brushing your teeth, 
I've given the example of the shower. You probably have a way, like some of you go top down, bottom up, whatever it is, but you'll like wash yourself the same way and the same part. And you don't think about it, you just do it. You grab this, you know it's always there, and it's very subconscious how you do it. It's dangerous when you do that with speech, though, right? So this is where it talks about we have to be prudent in anything we want to change. I'm using this in the context of speech. But in anything we want to change, you have to apply that prudence, right? Come on, read on. If thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. And if thou bow thine ear, thou shalt be wise. That's another thing from the book. Listen more. Listen more. We're so ready to say what we want to say. We're so ready to speak that we don't hear things out, right? Um, we got a, a complaint against somebody the other day on the captain's thing. And a bunch of the captains were, like, already passing judgment on the brother without having heard the whole truth, right, before they were, like, passing judgment, right? We have to be better listeners and not be so quick to want to say what we want to say, right? So it says, if thou love to hear, thou shalt receive understanding. Don't sit there. And hearing doesn't mean just that you're speaking in the moment someone else is speaking. It means don't be in there in your head with waiting for what you want to say, all right? You know, what's a better thing to do, depending on the context of the conversation, obviously not every conversation allows that, uh, it's better to sit down, write what you want to say as someone's speaking on like a notepad or something, and then throw it out your head so that you can really listen to them. Because this is where you get a lot of confusion and misinterpretation in, in stuff, right? Another thing is they call active listening, where sometimes you'll need to ask for clarity and say, well, well, can you explain that more to me? Because I don't want to put my definition to what you're saying. Right? You going to say something? Yeah, that's basically called listening from the other person's frame of reference. Okay? Um, difference between you here uh, uh, listening from empathy, you brought up a good one. Active listening is what exactly what it is. Because that's basically what that is. When you speak with someone, really engage and show them that you care. How do you show them that you care? By listening. Not by speaking over them. Okay, but by listening, by acting with or showing care and thought for the future. Okay, and this in, in some cases it may it may be, um, you know, it, it always be don't be disingenuous about it because that's going to come through as well when you yeah you'll come through phony you right. know but yeah but that active listening listening from their frame of reference right um, like have you heard the term like you hear me but you're not listening mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing right so. A lot of times we'll hear people speak, but we're not really listening. And I'll tell you, I picked that up strongly in judgment. That's how I've been able to refine my listening skills is in judgment, right? So, like, a lot of times brothers want to be quick to say something, and I'll just hang back and ask questions and, well, well what do you mean? Well, you know, explain this. And it's from a genuine point of view. It's not always to trap someone up. They trap themselves up because I listen enough if it's something, you know, that's incorrect. But... You want to be able to listen. So it says you have to love to hear. You have to love to hear. There's so many cliches about it, right? You were given two ears, one mouth, right? So listen more. Okay. All right. All those, they're all out there for a reason, right? But we're giving you biblical stuff. It says if you love to hear, you will receive understanding. And if thou bow down ear, that shall be wise. Come on. Stand in the multitude of the elders and cleave unto him that is wise. And we use the scripture in a lot of different ways. Like if, you know, leadership's around and you have an opportunity, you know, be around them or whatever. But listen, you're in multitude of, uh, I, we are levels of an elder, right? I have a certain amount of experience. He does collectively, right? That's how board of directors do it, right? If you add up all our experience at this table, you probably have 40 years of experience in this troop combined, right? That's how they'll do it when they present something to you, like, if you're an investor in a company, they'd be like, the board of directors has over 300 years combined experience. You're like, damn, nobody lives to 300. How they got 300 years combined experience? Well, one guy was a CEO for 20, another's run a company for 40, you know. And if you have at least 10 people with those decades of experience, that equals 300-something years, right? So it's, it, collectively, that's a lot of understanding. That's a lot of knowledge and experiences. So there's value in being amongst the elders. Come on. Be willing to hear every godly discourse. Ah, and that's the key. It says godly discourse. We must be willing to hear every godly discourse. So it doesn't mean, let me be willing to hear all the gossip. Let me be willing to hear people talking about people when they haven't applied Matthew 18 to them. Right? It says, be willing to hear every godly discourse. So that means you need to receive every brother and sister that comes to you, and they're coming from you from the Bible. 
We should not be uh, dismissive. Well, no, I'm not going to talk to you because you get like this. Right? Listen, at some point in the conversation, that may happen. But if they're making the attempt, then it says you should be willing to hear every godly discourse. And if all scriptures are commandments, then that's a commandment. So, and you know how else you don't keep that commandment? Not just, you know how else you could be dismissive? Waiting to say what you want to say while they're talking. Just like we went over. Not really listening. You want to just say your piece, being spaced out when they're speaking to you, because like, right, I want to let them speak, so then I can say my thing. All right? I'm telling you, it's such a much more productive conversation if both of you are going to listen and do that. And let me tell you something. If a lot of questions are asked on both sides, then you know you're having a very super productive conversation, because that's people who are genuinely listening, and then if they don't understand, they're clarifying, right? So you're doing clarifying statements. So come on, read on. Be willing to hear every godly discourse, and let not the parables of understanding escape thee. And don't let the and notice it said the parables of understanding won't escape you if you're basically more willing to hear and you have a willing spirit and you have a careful prudence to it, right? Like you, it's a thoughtful application of let me really try to soak this in, right? Come on. And if thou seest a man of understanding, get thee betimes unto him. And let thy foot wear the steps of his door. Right. So it says a man of understanding. This could mean a sister of understanding because we have things with the new sisters and they meet something. But what determines understanding? We've gone over this before. What determines understanding? Yeah, just call it out real quick. Right. So you need to look at that. And then within that context, if there's a sister or a brother that's been applying God's laws for two weeks and there's one that's been applying them for seven years, who has understanding? Uh, they both have understanding. It's a trick question. But <laughs> you're not playing Kahoot no more? Remember, I said the fear of the Lord is the beginning. But who's the one who's going to really probably have that deep understanding, right, that you would consider elder in that? The one who has more time doing it, right? The scriptures are that powerful. Yes, if you've been keeping the laws for two weeks, guess what understanding you have? What, what, what's your understanding if you've been keeping the law for two weeks? Huh? Nope. It's a specific thing. You have fear. You know that you should fear the Lord because somebody started keeping the commandments. It don't matter which ones they're keeping, they started keeping the commandments. Right? They have a fear because they started keeping. That's what makes you start keeping the laws, right? Fear. Damn, I'm going to be judged if I don't do this. All right. Sometimes it might be grudgingly at first. Damn it. There goes poker on Friday nights. There goes the club or whatever it is that you like to do, right? They have fear, which is the beginning, so that's good. But the good understanding has those who have been applying more, right? And the longer and the longevity you have in that, that's what is a more precious understanding. Come on. Let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord and meditate continually in his commandments. He shall establish thine heart. And give thee wisdom at thy own desire. Speech is a form of wisdom. Proper speech and how to speak is a form of wisdom. And it says, if your mind is upon the ordinance of the Lord's and you meditate continually in his commandments, you will find it there. You can find everything in the Bible. Everything. You just got to have the understanding to know how to find it. It's not, gonna, it's not always found with the word that we use today for something. It's not always found with the exact situation that we use today. So you go, and if you're able to search the scriptures, you're able to find what's most applicable to what they call it or what manifestation of it is today, right? Let me get uh, Proverbs 3 and 7. See, the first step is understanding that you don't speak right to people or speak right in general. So we're trying to open up the levels to how do you wind up changing that, right? So Proverbs 3 and 7. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So be not wise in thy own eyes. When, when we read in Sirach 6 and 37, it says, If your mind is on the ordinances of the Lord and you meditate continually in his commandments, he will establish thine heart, meaning he will establish thy mind. So the reason I go to Proverbs 3 and 7 is to show you you need to first, before you make any type of adjustment or change in regards to speech or anything, 
is apply Sirach 6 and 37. And if your mind upon the ordinance of the Lord and you meditate continually, it says he will establish your heart. That means he will establish your ideology. He will establish your, your thought pattern, your thinking, right? That's when uh, sometimes people call it I had an epiphany, right? It's like basically a big drastic change in how you view things. Sometimes you'll read a scripture and you're like, dang, damn, that's the one. That's, uh, damn, I, didn't, I never even realized that, right? That's, that's a major change going on, right? And if you want to get all sciencey with Esau, synapses are firing and reconfiguration of the pathway. When you learn and you ingrain something in you, that's what's happening. Esau calls that the neurons and the synapses. The Bible says that's establishing your heart. It's getting set in you. Once you accept that, once you say, gosh, this is the way I got to do it, and then now that's all you ever do, when it comes to that, that's what I do, right? Keeping the Sabbath. For some time, for some, it's, it takes a while for people before it becomes an automatic. Now it's established, right? Like it's to the point where if, like, if I can't keep a Sabbath, and it's rare, all praise to the most high, I feel weird, right? You feel like out of space, out of context, all right? So that's what it means to establish. Were you going to say something, Shlomo? Did you have your hand up? Ah, that is the term. That's right, plasticity. Look at him. Don't let his thuggish look confuse you, all right? It's an intelligent brother over there. I don't know. He had me nervous when he had the braids out, though. He looked real rough. Did y'all see him on the moon with the braids out? I gave him my car keys, my wallet. He didn't even have to say anything. I know I'm being racist, right? Let me stop. Uh, he, looks more, he looks more passive that way. That's good. Anyway, so you can't be wise in your own eyes. Read Proverbs 3 and 7 again. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. See how it's all interconnected? How do you not be wise in your own eyes? Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It's basically saying the same thing that Sirach 6 and 37 said. Read that again real quick, Sirach 6 and 37. Sirach 6 verse 37 let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord and meditate continually in his commandments. All right. So fear of the Lord is starting to keep them. What we read in Proverbs 3 and 7 is said, uh, fear the Lord. So you're keeping them. And departing from evil, you depart from evil by applying the commandments. You're not doing evil if you're doing the commandments. All right? Come on. He shall. He shall establish thine heart. And, and if you do that, he'll establish your heart. Go ahead. And give thee wisdom at thine own desire. And your desire is going back to what we read in verse 32. If you have the willing spirit, if you apply prudence, right? And with the application of these commandments. So you have to have that humility to acknowledge the error and then say, okay, I want to be able to receive a change in this and how I change my ways. Let me get Romans 12, 16. Yeah. Uh, so, Shalom. Shalom. Um, when we, you said knowing, learning the people's name and then saying their name back to them, right? Mm -hmm. Many times. Um, when we go out and teach, like I have, I'm horrible with names. Is it okay to be asking him, your name was such and such, right? Is that? That's how we do it. You'll see me in a parham do that every time. Um, like and Mariah does it. Okay. That's how it will. Hey. Uh, what, it may not start that way. We start with a few scriptures, and then we see the get uh, Brother, what's your name, brother? What's your name? Or let's say something was contentious, and we're replacing a brother. That's usually the first thing we start with. You know, and, and that also pacifies them. So if they're bucking up or whatever, uh, what's your name, brother? All right, brother, uh, this is my name. Okay. So now, and then you'll see us say, so I went through this scripture, and I went through this. So, you know, let's say his name was uh, Musa, like the guy you taught that time. <laughs> Musa, Musa, all right. So Musa, we already established this. We already established that. So... Yes, you should use that in your in your teaching and in your tactics. No, yeah, but what I'm saying is I like forget names, but I'd be like, hey, your name was... Uh, well, it helps Musa you remember again. it. It right. helps you remember it when you repeat it back to them. Right, your name was again? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's bad too because you'll meet somebody, and a lot of us are bad like that, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, hi, nice to meet you. And they're like, what the hell was their name again? And they just told it to you like before you just said what you said. So it goes to show how, like, we don't really alert enough. We're not, again, you're not applying prudence. 
There's not a care when you meet someone. There's not a care to, you know. So there's little mechanisms that you could do. So, like, you know, if I come in and you're like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, you know, I'm Soldier Shire. We'll be like, oh, okay, Soldier Shire. Hey, Soldier Shire, I'm Captain Yashua. Nice to meet you. And I've already now heard it from you. I said it to myself. Now I repeated it back to you. Now that's all just little tactics that you pick up and you learn on how to do that stuff. Good. So two things. You know why you're horrible remembering names? Because you believe you're horrible remembering <laughs> names. No, I'm serious. You <laughs> no, and I'm serious. And and, 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 and no, he is serious. I'm laughing because we used to say that so yeah. much. Not just yeah. with names, but with anything. With anything, yeah. When you're like, yeah. damn, I suck at this. Do you know why you suck at that? Right. Because no, and it's you true. say and you I, suck at that. Right, right. And it's the truth, actually. And like Cap brought out, there's little tactics. One of the things I, and y you guys see me, he brought it out. We do it at camp. You want to really put the defenses down? Stop mentioning their name. Mention their name. That helps a lot of times. A lot of times in our teachings, when we've done it, get, because now you in, or introducing yourself, because now you brought down that wall. You know what? I'm a pariah. Hey, that's what hostage What's negotiators name, do. That's one of the that's one of the tenets of a hostage negotiator. Right. Get that's their right. name, and that's why people who have really want to commit their crime to be like, my name's not important. You know, my name is no, right. Mis, my name is Mr. Gray it, because they even understand. The power of you giving them their real right, name, Mr. Orange. because if he starts to say it works, it, it's it's like kryptonite. Like There's you can't defend it. against it. There's power in it, mm -hmm. right? This is why you see like movies and stuff with the name. This is why you got these camps that are so unwrapped in the name. There's right. power in a name, right. Right? right? But they just take their power to another level. They think it's no. They think they think it's Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> They think it's Shazam. You were going to say something else? No, yeah. Like, brothers have probably seen it in camp. When you ask the brother for his name, they'll say, well, that's not important. Because they know that when you when you get that name, that that wall's coming down a little bit, and then you're being invited into their personal that's space. That's a good point. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Yep. Um, Romans 12, 16. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Be not, be not high things. Mine, well, mine says mine not. Yours says be not. Oh, I'm sorry. Mine not hide things. It's just highlighted for me. Okay. Mine not hide things, but but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Um. So do me a favor. Look up. Uh. Actually, no. We don't need to look it up. I thought I had it, but. It says, be not wise in your own conceits. It's the same thing we read in Proverbs 3 and 7, and it still goes back to what we read in Sirach 6 and 37, because it talks about you want the Lord to establish your mind. So what it says here, and this is a good application when you're dealing with brothers and sisters and how you speak, is be of the same mind one towards another, right? And guess what? Do you really know their mind? Like, can you read what's in their mind? No, right? But you're both keeping scriptures, right? I mean, you're keeping commandments, right? So it's in there. You just got to tap through to it. And the way you tap through to it is stop the presumptiveness of what's in someone's head, what's in mind, this, that, and the other, right? So it says, when it says be of the same mind one towards another, again, it should be godly discourse. The intention should be godly discourse. And it says, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Now, this has very specific meaning, right? When it says condescend to men of low estate, but what it means is, overall, in this context of speech is consider who you're speaking with, right? Consider who it is. Again, it goes back to considering the audience. And your audience could be one brother or sister. It doesn't mean everybody there, right? Like uh, later, we'll read in Jude where it talks about if some have compassion, if some don't. We need to know when and how to say something. This is when Paul was talking about, I'm all things to all people, to the weak I was weak, to the strong I was strong, Right? You have to know who you're speaking with and consider to an extent, right? And if you don't know, it says be of the same mind towards each other. So the assumption is when I speak with somebody, if I'm doing it properly, I don't walk around, right? And I'm dealing in the context of brothers and sisters because you should walk around believing you're better than the heathen, right? Because the Bible says we are. But I don't walk around with that mindset when it comes to brothers and sisters, all right? Even with me having rank, authority, I'm not like, oh, this is just a lowly member coming up to me and let me not listen to this. It's never, never in my mind, all right? I, I, I think about it when, because uh, I always, always talk about how sisters bicker and stuff like that. Man, I just see my brothers, like, like really? Like, you know, you talk to Esau and they're like, I don't see black or white. I really don't see any of that. I don't even really see tribes. I know I joke about the tribes and stuff with y'all, 
but it's because I'm trying to point it out in y'all, because I don't see tribes. I don't look at somebody and go, oh, that's, that's that Judite. Oh, that's that, that's that Benjamite, right? So I don't do those things like that. I just see this is my brother that's keeping the commandments, and he comes up, and I'm going to deal with him like that, right? Of course, there's context. If it's a matter of judgment and, you know, some authority has to be passed and I have authority, then, of course, then that's when the rank comes into play. But I, I consider and entreat all people the same, you know? Now, when I start to form my opinion is if you're talking up here crazy to me, I'll be like, <laughs> and if I side my head, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this person is out of their damn mind. <laughs> huh? But guess what? They'll never see that. I'm like, okay, all right, shalom. And I'll be like, yo, what the hell, man? Tell security, don't let those people. No, I'm kidding. I don't say that. I don't do that. The part about security, everything else I do do. All right. So <laughs> read, read Romans 12, 16 again. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low So state. mind not high things also goes into stop having things in your head waiting to speak. When you're engaged in the conversation, be engaged in the conversation. Be present in, in what you're doing, right? Come on. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceits, meaning don't be wise in your own eyes, in your own eyes, right? So, um, damn, I have this note here. Wait, what did we read here? Be not mine, I don't know, the condescension of be not wise. I don't know why I had this note here. Oh, no, it's for the next phase. Okay, Proverbs 26, 24. I'm going off my first draft notes. Normally when I do a class, I'll do like a rough draft. And then I'll rewrite it neatly in my notebook. But I'm doing my rough, I'm, I'm going off my rough draft. Like we all have different methods in how we do it. I told you how like Lava, the way he does his, I, I, like I can't make sense of his class notes. He, he does like a brain map. No, it works for him. He does like a brain map. It's literally, he'll put the topic in the middle, he'll draw a circle, and then he'll just put all the different thoughts that he has there. And, but it works for him. Like I, and that's just not me. My mind needs it kind of organized and lined and stuff like that. Now I looked over at his notes one day and like, I started twitching. I said, <laughs> so it works for him. It works for him. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think. You can't give me his notes, and I'm not going to be like, what? <laughs> like, if he told me, here, teach my class for me. Here's my notes. Like, what? Anyway, Proverbs 26, 24. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 24. He that hateth disassembleth with his lips. And layeth up deceit within him. Wait, hold on. Let me get there. 26, 24. Read it again. Proverbs 26, verse 24. He that hateth disassembleth with his De lips. Dissembleth. Dissembleth. Dissembleth with his lips. And layeth up deceit within him. What is dissembleth? And I want you to pull up the definition of dissemble for me. What is, what is it to dissemble? Dissemble. Do you know? Take a stab. It don't got to be the... Is known uh, to buy... Is that is that what that's the note in his Bible? Let me see. Does mine have a note? Oh yeah, mine does have a. Is known. <laughs> uh, Tobias, go ahead. Uh, to pull apart. Okay. The same thing. You were gonna say the same thing. Okay. All right. Look up the definition. Make it bigger. Conceal one's true motives, feelings, or beliefs. That's what it is to dissemble. It's deceit. It's deceitful speech in this context. Read it again. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips. So if you have deceitful speech, and a lot of you sisters got deceitful speech, when you're being corrected with each other, brothers too, but your sisters is, is casual for some of y'all. I'm saying some of y'all. Listen, if the shoe fits, wear it. Don't be upset. But we got to address the characteristics and call it what it is, all right? If it's not you, then nobody would take offense to it, all right? But I tell, you hear that a lot, that dissembling type of speech, that deceitful speech. What's really behind that is hatred. It says you have a hateful spirit. Why? Because what we read before in Romans 12 said you should have the same mind one towards another. And you'll put deceitful speech. I mean, uh, somebody give me an example of deceitful speech in a conversation. Between a brother and sister, let's say, or brother and brother. Eliezer, go ahead. Officer Eliezer. 
smoke. It's long. Um, it's mostly like murmuring, like ADG. No, everybody. I want you to like role play it. Like say oh. something that would be deceitful speech. Oh, uh, hey, did you hear about old boy? Yeah, man, yeah, I heard that. Nah, no, that's girl. murmuring. Oh. Deceitful speech is not that. Oh, okay. Uh, Othania. Shalom. Shalom. Want me to act out? Act it out. Okay. Yo, bro, so congratulations on being a soldier. I'm real happy for you. <laughs> and he's not really happy, right? <laughs> didn't pass the test. Hatred. Okay, that's good. That's Hatred. good. Uh, I'm going I'm to give, give you like a real blatant one. Uh, a brother or sister says something, right? Two or three witnesses heard it. And then you ask them about it, and they'll say, I don't remember that I said that. That's deceitful. That's deceitful. Really? You don't, you don't remember? Or they'll tell you, well, if you say I said it, then I probably said it. That's deceitful. That's dissembling speech. That's deceitful. Um, or they'll say, oh, but that's not what I meant. Right? But the words are, right? It, I'm not talking about uh, the tone, right? Because that's another thing altogether when you deal with tone. But, like, literally they were like, I hate your guts. No, but that's, I didn't mean, like, I hate them. Right, <laughs> I bet, I bet, like, I bet, like sometimes, she does things that gets me so vexed that it makes me feel like I might want to hate him. And but I'm telling you, this is the type of this is the type of stuff. Not really, not, not brothers so much. I'm telling you, sisters, man. Some of y'all just, boy, yeah. The world, the world's done a number on y'all because y'all just don't want to let the scriptures rain down on you, right? so that you can wash all that stuff out. It's deceitful speech. So it has many manifestations. So uh, yours, your, that was good, Othaniel, right? It could be just like that, right? But a lot of times it comes in a form of you address somebody and they're telling you, no, that was not my intent, whatever, right? And all the evidence points contrary. It's, it's a lie. Deceitful speech is lying. It falls under the same thing, right? It's lying. It's dissembling, okay? Or, you know, you'll have the brother or sister that they're always trying to flatter you right? And it just comes across as so disingenuous or whatever it is. Deceitful speech, right? They probably hate you so much that not to show it, they got to come up and compliment you, right? People, I'm sorry, people got a lot of issues going on inside of them, right? So it says dissemble. Uh, um, to verse, we did 24. Read 24 again. We're going to go straight down. Proverbs 26, verse 24. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. And he layeth up deceit within themselves. Because the scary thing is that sometimes that goes back to that humility and not realizing how you are, that you're not able to. And it says you're laying up, you're storing up deceit inside of you. It's going to compound itself and you're going to make yourself worse. Come on. When he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. So you'll have the most pleasant speaking. So I'm saying, they, they, and this is why I usually say it's sisters, because they'll have the most pleasant speaking, because we've heard it. I'll tell you. So one of the most pleasant speaking sisters that, I've, that, that we had here was a demon, bro. Remember, she had the soft voice. It was all melodic and everything like that. And then she wrote this, like, diabolical letter of, like, and, and I was there at the Passover. And I took a drink, and I just started laughing. And I knew, because I would never be coming back. <laughs> and it was then. Uh, hey, that happened here. Talk about how you see Phoenix, right? Had another one, real pleasant speaker, running around telling people uh, Northern Kingdom is not really, uh, it's not who they say it is, and this, that, and the other. But man, she won't come up to the face and say that to any one of us. I was waiting for her to say it to him, so I could be like, but I'm Southern Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Pleasant speaking, pleasant speaking. Read that verse again. When he speaketh fair. When he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Some of you have that characteristic. And it says, because you, you're, you're accustomed to speech that dissembles. And it says, within yourself, you're laying up more abominations when you're like that. So you speak fair. And it says, don't believe somebody like that. Because it says there's seven abominations in their heart. Come on. Whose hatred is covered by deceit. Their hatred is covered by deceit. 
Their hatred is covered by deceit. That's the ones that give you the biggest shaloms. If it's a brother, he giving you the big hug, patting your back mad hard like he burping you like you a baby. Like, bro, right? What the hell is this? Come on. His wickedness shall be shewed before the whole congregation. Give it time. Give it time. That person will be revealed. Sometimes, man, people come up to me, God, damn, how come we didn't judge this person yet? Just wait. Just wait. I want, I want the most high to reveal it. I want it to be clear and cut because Israel gets emotional, right? They get real emotional real quick. So sometimes you got to let the evidence build up so that they can really be revealed. And then it's like, oh, damn. So there's without a shadow of a doubt, right? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Come on. Whoso diggeth the pit shall fall therein. And he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. So it talks about basically this is the type of person that this person is with that deceitful speech. You dig a pit, you're going to fall therein, right? Because you get to a point where if you're digging a pit, you are not. You have to get in there to continue to dig the hole, right? And then before you know it, if you didn't create provision. So it's telling you, somebody who is accustomed to that dissemble of speech, this is how you wind up in that. It starts with a small thing, and then before you realize, you're like, oh, my gosh, right? What do I do? And it's not like you can climb out now because you was throwing all that dirt up out there, right? So you dug yourself a hole. Come on. A lying tongue hated those that are afflicted by it. A lie. So it, if a person is so okay lying to you, it means that they hate you. It says a lying tongue hate of those that are afflicted by it. Because the one that's afflicted by it is the one you told the lie to. So if you're accustomed to this type of behavior... It says that you have hatred in your heart. Come on. And a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So remember, I said earlier about the, the type of brother or sister with the fair speaking, that they're always flattering. And it's not saying that flatter don't mean don't compliment people, but there's a way and there's a certain type of person that they just will not be reproved. They will not let this wisdom come over them so that the Most High establishes their mind. And then... Before you know it, you're like you're full of so much evil. And I, remember, we we're talking about laying up for yourself treasures in the kingdom. And it says here you wind up laying up deceit inside of yourself if you roll this way. So it's so important just from that perspective alone. It shouldn't be like an optional thing that, oh, you know, I just want to speak better to people. It's so important that we consider our speech because you can deceive yourself. You can cost yourself the kingdom for not trying to get yourself better at it. So don't if, if, you're, if you're slow of speech, don't let yourself stay that way. Apply these things so that you can work on it and get better. Let me get Ecclesiastes 5 and 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. So it says, don't be rash with your mouth. Remember how I said before, sometimes you got to count? One, two, three, four, five. Whatever it is that you got to do, think before you speak. Don't be rash with your mouth. And it says, and let not thine heart be hasty to other anything. Meaning your mind. Especially if you know your mind is not established in the, in the Lord yet. If the God hasn't established your mind, it says, hold your peace. Right? It says, be quiet. And then it says... Uh, remember that anything you utter, you're uttering it before God. It says, for God is in heaven and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. Somebody explain that part to me. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Officer Eliezer. Yeah, not let thy hands be few, let thy words be few. It's going into. It's going into how you be um, judged on every outer word. Mm, where's that? I don't recall. Okay, Matthew twelve thirty six. We're gonna come back here. <clears throat> Matthew twelve and thirty six. That's exactly what that's going into. Matthew twelve and thirty six. Saint Matthew chapter twelve and verse thirty six. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So hold Matthew, because we're going to read a few more scriptures in there. But when you read in Ecclesiastes, this is why it says don't be rash with your mouth. Don't be hasty to speak. Some of you just talk, 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 talk. 
and talk, 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 talk. Very loquacious. Loqua <laughs> loquacious, you're right. That's that's a very good word. That's you know what that's good that would be good for uh, cranium, like to try to spell that one? Mm. Loquacious. It's it's well backwards, forget <laughs> it. I could spell it forward. It's L O Q. Right? Some of y'all think it's C. Anyway, loquacious, right? Meaning you don't have an economy of words. You, you, all you do is talk, 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 right? And we're going to start diving into what happens when you have a multitude of words as well. The scripture says there's sin within the midst of that. So it's important that we have, there's a thing called an economy of words. Say what you need to say with as few words as possible. Anything more than that, you start to let all types of, because listen, the reality is, the secret is, all of us have some abominations lying inside of us, right? So it's so important that we, this is why Christ said, uh, out of, from within, out of the mouth proceed of all these things. So each and every one of us, no matter how eloquent our speech is, has things that can, so it doesn't mean that just because your speech is eloquent, now I can get real wordy, right? I can get real loquacious. It says that I should go ahead and have an economy of words in that. Because you must understand, not even just for the offense of your brother and sister, but God is watching every word. Because it says, God's up there and you're down here. Understand that. So let your words be few. Go back. Uh, so now, Matthew 12, read verse 34. Start there. St. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. There it goes, going all the way back to Ecclesiastes 6.37 and the keys to letting the Most High establish your heart, which is your mind. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart. So when we read in Romans how it said, be of the same mind one towards another, Right? It's letting you know that if that mind is this, if that mind is biblical, then you don't have to fear God's judgment in the words that you speak because it's based on that. So I think when we start to think of how we speak and what we say to each other in that manner, if you have a healthy fear of the Lord, notice I said a healthy because everybody will say they're fearful of the Lord. Well, that's why you're here. But if you have a healthy fear of the Lord where you let that thing rain down on you and guide every decision, Right? Your fear for God should, desire, should guide every decision you make, every decision, where you move, how you roll at your job, what time, how, how you operate day to day, every single thing. Your fear of God should dictate how that stuff goes. But if you have a healthy fear of the Lord, right, then you don't got to worry about what you, what you speak. This is why he says, you generation of vipers, you're evil. How can you speak good things? Letting you know that there will be evil people amongst us that will speak nice things. And they'll say all the right things and all the shaloms and I love you, sis. The sis is all big on that, right? I love you, sis. Right? Sissy. You're my sissy. You're my bestest friend that I've ever had. Even though you're in another part of the country and our relationship is solely on Facebook and we share memes. Uh, those are the biggest offenders. My sissy. Goodness, what are you going to say? Who, who was Christ referring to as the generation of vipers? Mm -hmm. Tobias. Quick, just call it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and they had the law, right, supposedly? Okay, but Christ saw through them. He already knew that that's what he called. That was his way of cursing them out. That's how you did it. Oh, yeah, that's man. not a nice word. <laughs> For him to call them vipers was not a nice right. thing. That was a huge, that was, might as well say other words. And the fact that he was saying it to what was then the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church. It's very offensive. That's why they was mad at him. They said, damn, we got to kill this right. Negro. Because remember, they would come with smooth words to him, would they not? And try to, and try to, trip, him. Try to trip him up. Exactly well, what and, happened. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's why he's saying it, because yeah. he, was, he was already vexed with their smooth words yeah. and them trying to be crafty, right? So, come on. Read on. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Right. So now he's, he's basically going to be saying in Christ's words what I just basically said to you. If your mind is in the right thing, if God has established your mind, you're going to speak the good things, right? Out of your heart. Come on. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So something as subtle as your speech will reveal your, will reveal your evil. 
the point that Cap made is very heavy because when he says, when you understand that Christ was saying this to the Pharisees, right? That means, what were the Pharisees known for? Their phylacteries, their outward showing of how they kept the law. And you have the same thing amongst brothers and sisters here. So it's, it's deceptive because you would think that just by looking at some of these brothers and sisters that they are righteous. Oh, the sister has the nicest fringes, the most modest apparel. She's always in the midst of something, you know, good, right? But then you start to notice subtleties in her speech and how she might operate amongst the sisters, right? Brothers, sometimes some of y'all creep in that way too and how y'all try to operate. And usually with brothers, it's like a preeminence thing. They'll try, they'll try to get themselves a spirit where they want to be the go-to, right? And then with women, it's a lot of different motives, right? It's preeminence. It's, um, you know, um, uh, they just like attention, right? Um, and then they have evil intentions, right? And maybe, maybe it's to spread heresies rather than let me deal with uh, asking the questions to get understanding on doctrines, right? Because we all come from different doctrines. Whether you came from Catholic Church, the, the Christian Church, whatever denomination you went. Hey, some of y'all come from other camps. And there's pollution in your mind that you need to, let me tell you, there's only one thing that all camps teach the same. That African Americans are Israel, because not all camps even teach that Northern Kingdom is Israel. That's the one thing that all, and that Christ is black. Other than that, all types of different ideologies in, in the mix. Okay, we had a sister come in here subtly and give out letters with a doctrine. Right, right. Right Remember, underneath securities. Notes. I know. The, the head of security at that time, right? Yes. I know. <laughs> I'm not pointing the brother out, but it did. One of the brother that he was like, blessed is he that read him. <laughs> we, know, we, know who, we know who he is. I just brought it up because that spirit can come in He's here today. <laughs> he's redeemed himself. That's right. All praise is that he's here today. He's redeemed himself with that. So the point is, is that don't get fooled, right? And you know that by listening well to people's speech. Right? And how you speak to them is going to bring certain things out in them. Come on, read on. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. I know. I give this one to my wife a lot when she like tries to get fresh with me. I'm like, yo, every idle word. I say, oh, but I was just said it in anger. I said, okay, tell that to the Most High in Christ in that day that you said that to me in anger. See how you deal with that. Right? Come on, read. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Hey, and that's coming straight from the king. By your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's what I mean when I say I let people speak. They're going to condemn themselves, or they're going to justify themselves. So a lot of times we want to talk, 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 talk. Let your words be few. Ask your questions. Ask your clarify. And someone's going to reveal themselves. This is how you could be in a situation where you're saying something so clear and the person that you're engaged with doesn't hear it, it's because they're not applying any of these things that comes to speech. Because they don't want to receive it. They don't want it. That's how, let me tell you something. That's how you get a breakdown in applying Matthew 18, is that one of the people involved doesn't want to deal with the speech. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to listen. They don't know how to receive it. Because there should always be an understanding that comes out of it. But the Most High knows that there, that there isn't, so this is why he has the steps to it. And that's why he says, listen, after you bring it to the church, when you get to the third step, who else is going to be able to persuade somebody? Nothing, because at that point, so many witnesses have been brought forth, so many. And then, you know, you're going to have somebody that stands there and just say, oh, nope, y'all are still wrong, and I'm right. That, that, you got to throw somebody like that away. You can't, do, you can't work with a mind like that, right? Uh, let's get Ecclesiastes 5 again. Read verse 2, and then we're going to jump to verse 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. So, right, sometimes you got to hold your peace. Think before you speak. Come on. For God is in heaven. 
and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. So we all should be very understanding that we speak out of the abundance of our heart, and none of us are fully set by the Most High's mind, right? We all have things where our thoughts sway. We in anger, right? We'll curse. We'll we'll call somebody a name, right? Whatever it might be. He says, if that's the case, man, sometimes it's better just let your words be few because if every idle word, that means there's a cost, there's a consequence to throwing out something before having it thoughtfully crafted in your mind. And the consequence is from the Lord. And if you have that healthy fear, you say, damn, let me, let me, let me be a little more easy in my speech, right? Come on, jump to verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Don't let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Especially you sisters. I'm telling you, because it's a lot. I, I, always hear, I always hear some BS. It's because some sister said something. It's not even because she did something a lot of times. It's because y'all said something. It says, suffer not your mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Because there's a compounding effect that happens. Come on. Neither say thou before the angel that it was in error. So what does he mean when he says, neither say thou before the angel? Uh... Othaniel. We all, we all have an angel that kind of takes account. Uh, you have a scribe. Each and every one of us has a scribe. What you call, oh, I got my guardian angel. Your guardian angel ain't just there to look out for you. He there to tell on you to the most high. All right? I'm telling you, when you're ready to speak some stuff that you know you shouldn't be speaking, you should be like, Damn. We have a scribe that's letting the Most High know all this stuff. This is why he says, to say thou before the angel, because each of you has one, right? That's responsible for a report on you. Read it again. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was in error. So it doesn't mean that you address your, I mean, now that y'all, some of y'all never knew that and you know that you might address the angel, right? They ain't going to address you back, okay? But you might be like, damn, I'm sorry. But, you, you know, the point is, once a word is out, yes, you can apologize for it. Yes, we need to forgive each other, right? 70 times 70. But it's out. So we got to be more mindful of that, right? So it says, so don't try to say before the angel, oh, it was an error. Come on. Wherefore, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? You don't want to anger the most high by the report that the angel gives. And then it destroys all the good that you've done, if you've done any good, right? And listen, it might not be one word or whatever. They, like I said, there's a compounding effect. Remember, we have that grace in Christ to try to work on ourselves and get ourselves right. Uh, it, it's like Arthan. He says, uh, see, that grace goes away when we're in the wilderness. And Arthan said that he, he's just going to, uh, it's going to be even our thoughts, not our words, right? They're going to be able to see. He said, I'm just going to think chewing gum and water the whole time. Like, I don't even want to think anything, all right? I'm just going to be chewing gum water, chewing gum water, chewing gum water. <laughs> because you don't want anything to enter into your head, right? You don't, want, you don't want that type of thing going on. Read on. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. So he says, in the multitude of dreams, we're going to focus on many words, uh, there are also diverse vanities. So in a multitude of words, even if you're eloquent in your speech, invariably, inevitably, the more you speak, sooner or later something that shouldn't come out is going to come out. So it says you got to be able to have control of that. You're better off speaking less, speaking fewer words. And dreams, too. It says a multitude of dreams. How many times you get the dream, brother or sister, that's always coming and they tell you this dream, and it's really that, uh, listen, that's a device, especially women. And I'm sorry, women, y'all. Yeah, just these are all your, like, these are your things, right? Like, you know, if you look up, like, Superman and you look up his superhero power set, right? And if you look up women and you look up their power set, they'll use dreams to try. They'll sit down with you and be like, my Lord, I had a dream. That this, this, and this happened. And they might not have even had the dream, but they'll use it in a dream because they figure it softens the blow if they say it was a dream. Or they play to you and you're like, oh my God, my wife had a dream the most high. He showed her a vision. 
I had a dream of this, and it made me feel uneasy, or maybe, be careful with all that, be careful. They can be deceiving themselves and not even realize it. Let me get Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. And this is why it says fear God, because it goes back to not just the fear, but the fear is displayed by the keeping of his commandments. This is your primary directive. This is our pride. This is each and every Israelite's primary directive to fear God and keep his commandments. Come on. For this is the whole duty of men. Because under this umbrella falls all these things, even what we're speaking about today with speech. Fear God and keep his commandments. So if you feel like you're going astray ever, your words is going crazy, your speech ain't right, you got to remember your primary directive. Our purpose in life is to fear God and keep his commandment. That's our whole duty. Let me get Job 16 and 3. Job chapter 16, verse 3. Shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? It says, shall vain words have an end? Meaning words that have no value. Right? It says, will they have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? So sometimes when you have somebody that's a talker, that doesn't know how to speak in a few words, it says, what is it that prompts you to answer them. Come on. I also could speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stead. So meaning, don't get baited into some stuff with somebody, with a brother or sister. Sometimes it's better not to give an answer at all because somebody's trying to get a rise out of you. And sometimes it's done antagonizingly so, where there might be a direct conflict. In other ways, it's done in a subtle way, like the way the serpent deceived Eve. And he said... Oh, you too can be like gods if you did this. Playing on something that he saw in Eve and a desire that Eve had. People in this truth can do that too. And it might be a subtle way that they come at you. And sometimes it's better not to say anything at all in that moment. Because they're trying to pull you in because they know the power of those words that come out. You reveal something and they're going to... Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's a strong rebuke. And they'll say, okay, I'm never going to speak to this person about that again. And sometimes it's done in a subtle way where they're just trying to drop things. I'll give you an example. Someone's explaining to you a situation that you didn't have witness to, that you didn't see. And they'll say um, things like, well, what did you feel about that? All right? Listen, sometimes that don't warrant an answer. Well, I really don't want to talk about my feelings. <laughs> and, and you might confuse somebody. Like, well, what do you mean? You know? And you confound that spirit that's trying to pull something out. Or when somebody is like, you know, they're trying to lead you to a conclusion, but they don't want to say it. So they'll ask you questions like, well, it got me thinking, who in the body did this, this, and this? I don't know who. Come on, you know who. Who? And they know damn well it was like, you know, Pookie or Ray Ray or whatever it is, right? But they don't want to say it. They want you to say it. Because then that's like a, a confirmation where, oh, it came from, it's like Inception. It has to come from them, right? You seen that movie Inception? The whole thing was about if you get into their dreams and you plant the idea, it's more, um, it, it, it basically makes them, gives them more conviction and they're driven with more purpose because they think it was their idea. So you have crafty people who are crafty in their speech and they use this as a mechanism to make it seem like, you're the one that came up with that. And then it helps them absolve themselves in case you try to blow it. Well, I never said that person's name. That wasn't who I was thinking at all. You said that. Right? So sometimes it doesn't warrant an answer. So he says, yeah, I could speak as you do too if your soul were in my soul steed. Come on. I could heap up words against you and shake mine head at you. Come on. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. You strengthen them with your mouth. And this covers a gamut of things. It covers contentious conversation. It covers deceitful conversation. It covers that subtle conversation where they're trying to get something out of you. It says you would strengthen them with their mouth, with your mouth. Come on. And the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. All right. Let's look up the definition of, uh, a, I think it's assuage. Maybe you're right. Let's look it up. A-S-S-U-A-G-E. 
Oh, you're going to go with me? I could be wrong, bro. It says U-A-G-E. No, that's it. Some of y'all are using them old Bibles. That's the word. <laughs> Scroll up. <laughs> he said, I need a W. What, is, what are you thinking? A, a swag? No, my, my, mine is A-S-S-U-A-G-E. So that's probably the old spelling of it. You guys have a Bible that has the older word, right? Um, so it says to satisfy. That's the one I want, right? To satisfy. Not make a feeling of, we're dealing it, because when you think about it in the context of what we're speaking about, it says that, uh, and the moving of my licks should assuage your grief, meaning you're feeding into what exactly they want you to say or do. So you satisfy what their goal was. And it's the example of like that I gave you where they'll try to get you to say it instead of them. And then you confirm it and they're like, oh yeah, see, you came up with that. They, you came up, you deduce that yourself. That's, that's what they call in court, leading the witness. All right? You're trying to get them to say something without actually you saying it's exactly that thing. What verse are we at? Uh, read it again. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Though hey, wait, I, I want to know the, the, if that's the right pronunciation. Hit translation, word origin, see if it shows it. Assuage. Wait, no, go up. Yeah, it says it right there. Is That's a long A. Yeah, you're right, assuage. Yeah, go ahead. But I would strengthen you with my lips, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Come on. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. And though I forbear, what am I eased? So he says, though I speak, my grief is not assuaged, right? Meaning my thing is not satisfied. All I'm doing is satisfying your goal. And he says, and though I forbear, what am I eased? So it's basically you shouldn't even forbear with somebody like that. Like if you start to key in on that type of speech, you need to shut it down, right? You want to rise out of me. They're saying it's better to be quiet. Somebody's trying to get something out of you, right? Let's get Proverbs 10 and 8. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 8. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but the prating fool shall fall. Okay. So it says the wise in heart shall, will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Look up the definition of prate. P-R-A-T-E. All right. Talk foolishly or at tedious length about something. So again, the foolish is what? If it's something contrary to the way our conversation should be, right? Circumspect in, in front of our angel who's going to give witness to the most high, all right? And at tedious length about something. So somebody can be prating and not it be foolish conversation if they're long-winded, right? Loquacious. Loquacious brothers and sisters. So being long-winded is problematic as well, but it's, it's, it can be perceived as prating. So it says, the wise in your heart, the wise in your mind will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. If you're always talking, if you're at length with your words, it goes back to what I said earlier about always waiting to say what you want to say. You're not ready to receive any type of understanding that way. Back to the cliche, you got two ears and one mouth. So you should hear more and speak less, right? Proverbs 10, 19, jump down. Verse 19, in the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Hold back your speech. Be concise in what you have to say, because in the multitude of words, and when it says it wanteth not, it means there is no lack of sin. When you speak too much, there is sin in the midst, meaning so. It's because you're trying to conceal something. You're trying to beat around the bush. Let me get Proverbs 16 and 23. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. So the heart of somebody who's wise, the mind of somebody is wise, it says you got to teach your mouth. You have to teach your mouth. And it says, and you will add learning to your lips. So sometimes you got to teach your mouth to not 
speak the way you do. Sometimes you got to teach it to speak less. Sometimes you got to consider if something should be said at all. And then you also need to add learning to your lips so that when you do speak, appropriate words come out, an appropriate amount of words, and in appropriate context and in appropriate form. I'll give you another example. Not all of you are equipped, as much as you may think so, to deal with new brothers and sisters. They're going to invariably have a question, and some of you don't have the humility to know what you don't know. And you're going to try to provide an answer, and you can condemn a soul for that. So you're trying to put yourself in a position where you're taking inadvertently accountability for somebody in this walk, especially somebody new. And you want to be the representative of that whole thing? You could sway somebody off. You could dissuade them from wanting to be here because they didn't get a proper understanding of something or because you didn't know, hey, I don't know that I can answer that correctly. Let me refer you to somebody else. But for whatever reason, you wanted to be the one to deal with that person. Not everybody is qualified for that. Oh, but I'm a friendly person. and I, Okay, that's great. We're dealing with people who are coming in to get sick. It's like if I'm a freaking nurse, right, or uh, you've seen those surgery shows, right, and they have the uh, interns and the residents, right? Interns aren't allowed to go ahead and diagnose certain things until they fit certain requirements, right? Oh, I got to get a resident for this. This is too complex. I can't order this um, MRI or this thing. Uh, you know, I got to get the chief resident for that or whatever it is. And many of you who don't have the experience in this walk, and experience is not measured in years as much as it is in those years in understanding and application, right, like we brought out earlier, you're going to diagnose somebody wrong, and you're going to kill somebody, and their blood is on your hands in addition to what you got to deal with. You don't, don't get too deep. This is deep basics. This is deep basics. I'm not going over mysteries. We're done with that for a little while, right? The mysteries is done. <laughs> if the spirit moves me, we'll go over some other stuff. I know, everybody's like, Ugh. I remember what that was like. I've been there. Sometimes it's still like that. I go through some class, I'm like, oh, revelations. Anyway, read that verse again. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Right. We have the power in our mouths to speak righteousness or unrighteousness. And the angel can judge you, right? Like we read in Ecclesiastes. Uh, the idle words can be judged, like Christ said in Matthew, right? The examples that we gave in giving a wrong answer to somebody, right? You can build their spirit or break it in the way it's delivered, all right? There's so much context that goes into that. And something as simple as speech, something as simple as speech. This is why we harp on a lot of you and the way you speak to people. You don't realize the damage that you can do, Right? There was a brother that came up earlier, and uh, I wasn't thinking about him that much when I did this class, but he came up, he popped up, and I said, hey, pay attention to today's class, bro. I said, it's about you. He's like, oh, I know, you're going to tell me about this. And I said, no, it's not going to be about that. It was something else that he did. I said, something in general. So I had to ask another brother. I said, bro, what's the issue with this brother? He said, oh, it's the way the brother talks to people sometimes. Right, exactly. So you got to adjust that type of behavior and consider, right? Let's get Ecclesiastes 10 and 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 12. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. A wise man or a wise woman will speak graciously. And that doesn't mean it sounds melodic. It means that consideration of compassion or fire with an individual. Is this the right way for me to speak to somebody and address them? Yes, we're organized. Yes, we have order. And yes, we're militant. Some brothers ain't ready for that, brothers. And y'all want to bark orders at them like somebody that's been here a year, two years, that's used to that. And they understand that's how we're... That could be misperceived, right? Unfortunately, we don't have that boot camp intensive where they can come in and they understand that we're going to talk to them that way and we're going to deal with them that way because we're trying to accelerate their growth in this walk. Same thing with sisters. Some of y'all sisters... Just want to bark at people, newer people just beasting on them. Relax. 
And if you don't know how to deal with the situation and you can't tell when it's a time for compassion and when it's not, then leave it to a more seasoned person. Leave it to a more seasoned sister to deal with that brother or sister. There's levels to the offenses that we can give, and a lot of it stems from the speech. Read that again. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Come on. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and at the end of his talk is, mis is mischievous madness. Is mischievous madness. So it says the person who doesn't apply these things, who doesn't make the corrections in speech, it says the, even from the beginning of the words of his mouth, they're foolish. Foolish words come out. And then the end of his talk is, mis is mischievous madness. It's some, that's what I'm saying. I'll sit here sometimes and I'm looking at somebody. And like I was saying earlier, I don't see, you know, I see my brothers and sisters. And I'll just be like, oh, my gosh, this person's crazy, right? Because they speak in all types of madness. I'll be like, okay, all right, you know? But even what? Guess what? I'm wise enough to know, hey, they're coming out of something. This is an interview. Now, if you've been here four years and you're still talking to me crazy, then I'm probably going to tell you, like, are you out of your damn mind? Like, what the hell's wrong with you? But you're a newer person and you're here. You know, I'm observing kind of how you move. The report of you is good and stuff like that. I just know, okay, they're not fully over whatever it is, whatever madness they're coming out of, right? Hey, and some people will never get over that crazy. But then the most high will kind of show us how to deal with that in our own way, right? And sometimes the crazy's not infectious or whatever, and you just say, okay, right, uh, they're a productive member despite this, so, you know, we can manage this. We just know how to deal and speak with them. And then sometimes they got to go because they want to stab Edomites at the gas station in the eye. Oh, was he? Okay, all right. Some of y'all who've been here long enough, you know which brother I'm talking about that we had to send away off of that, right? So, you know, come on, man. <laughs> that was your fault for calling him rabbi. Anyway. <laughs> It was. It was. Started off as something, whatever. Anyway, read on. Read verse 14. A fool also is full of words. Ah, so those of you always talking, full of words, it says you're a fool. Come on. A man cannot tell what shall be. That's why I say you sit there like, my gosh, what the hell is going on with this person? Come on. And what shall be after him who can tell him? Right, because they're always talking. They're never listening. They're full of words. So who can tell them anything? Who can tell what's going to happen, what's going to be the end of them? Because they're not listening, right? Let's get Proverbs 25 and 11. So we've gone through different stages of this, showing you what it is to be slow in speech, showing you about deceitful speech. Now we've kind of shifted a little bit to letting you know we need to know when and how to speak to people, right? Watch this one. This is one of my favorites. Proverbs, Proverbs 25, 11. chapter 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. A word fitly spoken. A word fitly spoken. What does that mean? Just tell me plainly. Uh, Othaniel. Correctly spoken with sense and uh, not disassem dissembling somebody. No, not wrong, but not concise enough. Uh, Ashaya. Uh, knowing what to say, when to say it, the right words. Right, and right, knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. That's a fitly spoken word. A fitly spoken word. It says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So try to visualize that thing. Apples of gold. So basically, the frame is like a silver frame. You know those 3D, like, it's like a shadow box type of thing? So just picture like a beautiful silver frame, and you got like some real, I'm not talking about like some plastic styrofoam thing painted to look like gold, right? I'm talking about a real polished silver frame, and then the, the apples in there. Why? It's letting you know that the words are framed right. You're speaking properly. This is why it says it's fitly spoken. It says it's like apples of gold and pictures of silver. It just blends. It works. It makes sense. It looks beautiful, and it's received well. Let's get Proverbs 15 and 23. We're coming back to Proverbs 25. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth. And the word spoken in due season, how good is it? So when it says always be ready to answer, 
there's a lot that goes into that, right? So it says a word in due season. You know, it takes a very skilled person to sometimes say that word in due season to help uplift a brother or sister, right? We're always talking about correction and reproof, but what about somebody's dealing with something? What do you say, right? Like, death is a hard one, right? We don't know. Some people don't know what to say, right? Some people be like, oh, gosh, you know. Somebody tell you, okay, a lot of you brothers and maybe even some of you sisters, someone's non-believing family dies. They were evil as hell, right? She was on the pole till she dropped dead, the grandma. Let's just say. Sometimes I got to go extreme because y'all don't, right? Some of y'all, that's like their grandma or their mama, and you'll be like, well, damn, man, most high got her. Gosh, just because the mom was an unbeliever or the, or the pops or whatever, he was gangbanging or whatever, he was a pimp to the day he died, whatever it was. I mean a real pimp, not like a pimp like a player. Like he was really pimping, all right? Some of y'all be like, damn, the hell with him. Hey, listen, we know what the Most High got in store for them. I pray that the brother or sister know what the Most High got in store. That don't change that that was their pops. That don't change that that was their mom, right? Some of y'all don't even know how to console somebody in death. You don't know what to say. So guess what? Don't say nothing. It's better to just be quiet in that situation. Some of y'all don't know what to say. Right? We had a brother the other day, you know, he said his grandmother passed, whatever. I gave him a couple scriptures, right? Because I thought about it. I said, well, he know his grandma wasn't keeping no commandments. But that's his grandma, bro. The brother's taking it a little hard. I gave him a couple scriptures just reminding him that we know that the most high. And I said, hey, man, and Lord's will she get another chance. You know what I'm saying? Like, come back and... You know, my condolences to you, right? Let me know if you need anything. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. So something as simple as that, a word in due season, y'all don't know what to say, you know? I'm telling you, there's so many examples that you could give in that. It's better to be quiet. But in the meantime, while you're quiet, you have to work on yourself. You got to let the Lord establish your mind and work on your speech, all right? And until you know that you can speak right, say less, right? Say less. Um, I don't know if we got any extreme cases where some of y'all just need to be quiet at all. But say less, at least, right? Let's go back to where we were. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Come on. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. Right. So it says we must be a wise reprover, knowing when that answer is in due season and that it is fitly spoken. A wise reprover. And it says the result of that is an obedient ear. How it's conveyed and how it's said. So it says these things, he's comparing it to beautiful, fine, precious things. Because the, the reality is it's rare amongst our people, Right. Like, we were, you were joking about rude in speech, and there's some, many of us, sometimes in the teaching environment, are rude in speech, right? Depending on where we're speaking. Sometimes if somebody did something real boneheaded, have I not been rude in speech to you? Right. But did you deserve it? Okay. So, right? And I knew he could take it, too. Right? But sometimes it might not be, right? Sometimes I might have to go a different angle. And many of you who I've had to deal with, whether it's correction or whatever, you've probably seen both of me. You've probably seen a more tempered correction, and then you've seen me blasting you, right? Like pulling out the fire. Let's get Jude one twenty two. The scriptures taught me that. The scriptures taught me how to bring those things out and how to speak that way. And trust me, to a point, I get it. Some of you men that are put in certain positions... Um, you've never been over people, you've never had that type of thing, and maybe even some of you got some chip on your shoulder, and, you know, it manifests itself in that I got to speak hard to everybody sometimes. But we got to deal with that, and as long as you're willing to learn from it, you know, you'll be all right. And if you can't, then you just won't be in the position you are because you've shown you're not fit to be over anybody, right? Go ahead. Jude, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Mm. That's that wise reprover on the obedient ear. Of some have compassion. How can you tell which ones need compassion? Ashaya. There's a lot of situations. Depends. If the brother messed up and, like, he didn't do it, um, like, 
willingly, right? Then you'd be like, yo, correct him. Like, yo, bro, you shouldn't have done that. But also having compassion, I was like, all right, you're you're newer into this. I'm gonna take it easy on you. The next What's time, take it easy? Like if there's a judgment for that sin, do you not give that judgment? No, no, correction. Okay. Take it easy on correction. Judgment is another oh, for judgment it could be you really messed up and you need fire and or you were like, you know what? You messed up, but you're like, no. You're not wrong. You're just not framing it right. Isaac, I actually want a more simple answer. I don't even need all those detailed examples. That's not fitly spoken enough, officer. Officer Isaac. Where's your belt? Why you look like you're wearing a nightgown? That's terrible. I almost don't even want you to answer because you look so messed up. It was, uh, the belt was poking me in the back while I was sitting down. So I'll take it off real quick. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so... Y- <laughs> So you wanna you wanna be a wise reprover, prover like the last scripture said. So if uh it depends like if it's me, and I'm here I've been here for three going on four years versus another brother just coming in, the way you um the what way, the what, way what 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 if the brother's been here three four months and he's smoking meth and he's smoking meth does he deserve compassion? You need you need to still pull him out. You, you, if he's smoking meth, uh, you gotta pull. Him. Be quiet. Hey, you see uh, you see this officers of twenty. I'm not, I'm not even putting y'all on the spot. I pray y'all give the right answer. But you see your tents? All right? That's because the power was in the belt, bro. That's why. The power was in the belt. Off. I threw him off. Somebody else wanted to give it a stab? Uh, let me see Tobias. <laughs> uh, by listening to the situation and what they say, making a judgment call based on what they say and what comes out. That's good. That's good. That's the closest. But I wanted a more general. That's actually pretty good. That's pretty good. It's not about number of time, number of, of years or anything like that. All those are factors in what you decide to do at the end of the day. But it's always guided by the scripture. But really, the general answer I was looking for was what shows you compassion and what shows you when to pull out the fire is some time and understanding in the scripture and dealing with matters. Right? Dealing with matters. Meaning, not just because you've been here three years. You've sat in a seat three years. You've socialized with brothers or sisters for three years. That doesn't mean you know when to give compassion and when to bring fire. The point is it goes back to what? The application, let the most high set you. So what you were saying was not wrong. You just kind of, you kind of were struggling to word it. So you got to do better at that. You got to do better at that. And Isaac, where did he go? No, okay. I thought you ran out crying. Listen. <laughs> Look, uh, you're not totally wrong because sometimes it is, there is a consideration for that stuff, right? But that's why I try to trip you up. And I said, what if he's smoking meth? He's been here three months and he's smoking meth. Yeah, well, Bo, but th- these are the things that we're going to deal with. And we have to know how to deal with them and how, to, and how to pass proper judgment because there's a consequence for us in how we do that. Because when you tell somebody to leave, they're on their own. They're without the support. But then at the same time, depending on what the sin is, you can't keep that person here because then they'll pollute everybody else. So it's a heavy consideration that has to be made. So the the point that I'm really trying to get you to understand is that don't be so presumptuous about yourself that you think that you can answer everybody for every situation that you know when and how. You don't. Trust me, I I come across some things and I'm be like, well, I'm gonna have to talk to somebody else about that, you know. I'm gonna have to call Deacon Hatan's directly over someone. I'm gonna call Deacon Hatan about this one. How many times that stuff has come up? I think I know what we should do, but I want to be sure because you know somebody could be condemned off of that. And then what if I didn't deal with it right? The scary thing is I might not know till that day. Lord's will, I make it. I get to sit before judgment. Hey, you you know what? You're responsible for this, this, and this. You should have done this this way, and you knew better. All right, so read this again. Jude, verse 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Right, so of others we have to save with fear, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Let's get Ecclesiastes 12 and 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 11. The words of the wise are as are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given 
from one shepherd. So it says the words of the wise are as golds. Golds is basically a big spike that you would use to nail down the chains of the cattle, all right? So when you see those those cattle chains and stuff like that, the big spike you put in there. So it's letting you know the words of the wise are like golds and as golds and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. Letting you know that it's not just as golds and nails, but it's masterfully handled, right? Like by the master of assemblies, meaning there is a skill to speech. It is a craft to speak a certain way. And when used in righteousness, it can be beneficial to our people, right? It says, uh, what was the last line? It says, which are given from one shepherd. So it says, those words that we do speak unto them, they won't be our own words. Who is our one shepherd? Christ. So it's saying that correction, all those things, it needs to come from a biblical basis. I've heard some horror stories of some counsel brothers have given. And I was like, that's not biblical. And definitely you sisters, man, I don't know where you get some answers on how you reply to things, but it's not biblically based. You, some of you brothers, listen, I don't know, I'm going to be a little bit of a hypocrite because I don't sit down and go over class with my wife like that. Right? Usually it's a question and answer type of thing. Some of y'all need to sit down with your wives because your wives have no understanding. I'm talking about some of you officers. Your wives don't know a damn thing and they're making you look bad. They dense. Right? Remember, the scripture says don't give yourself over to a light woman. And if you came into this truth with her, it's your responsibility, according to Ephesians 5, to build her up and present her as you would have her. So some of y'all need to spend some time with your wives, right? Because it's, I'm going to start getting on the husbands when the wives jack up. Because you're, at the end of the day, y'all ultimately accountable for their behavior. So we, we're going to get to But listen, we, we, have, we have like a little process. It's not a set number of times or whatever. I let the sisters try to deal with it and work it out. If I continue to see that sisters are a problem, we're going to have to do a marriage council. And it's going to be involved with the husband, making sure that he's doing what he needs to do with the wife. You're going to need to find some time and sit down and, and spend some time teaching your wife. Like literally sit down. And teach your wife the things of how to deal with brothers and sisters, how to speak, how she should operate in the congregation, how she should speak to men. Some of your wives, they don't even know how to deal with, like, there's, there's no shame face to them at all. So we're going to have that type of discussion at some point. But it, the words come from one shepherd. So you have to understand it's not your own words. And I say the wise because many of the sisters are speaking their own words in matters of counsel. It's not biblically based. So that advice is not good. This here says contrary wise. Read it again. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. It's letting you know that it's an intricate process. Masters of assemblies. And it says that they will; those words will be like golds and like nails that fasten. It'll help and remedy and comfort their soul. That's how you get the obedient ear. We must speak biblically. Isaiah 50 and 4. Hey, and understand, biblically doesn't always mean you just quote the scripture. Just my advice needs to be based on it. Right? Of course, it's much better when you read the scripture, right? We, we went over the whole class about the Bible, and we saw how like even the references they made in the movie, The Book of Eli, and he was like, if the words come from there, they're more powerful, right? Because remember, you're dealing with the spirit that's on people, not necessarily them. I think a lot of times there's just a melding of it, because the scripture tells you it's two separate things. Uh, Galatians 5.17 says the spirit and the flesh war with each other. So what you're trying to get through is the spirit in those situations. And sometimes the spirit is just so beaten back that it don't realize that it's still in the fight. So you need it biblically based because if it's your own words, the demon just going to laugh at you. And it's going to continue to do what it do. So it has to be the words of the Bible because that's where the strength is. It's not, the strength doesn't come from any one of us. It comes from us using the Bible as, as the medicine for that situation. Go ahead, read that. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. 
chiefly the men, each of us have gotten this. But the sisters also, because according to Titus 2, it says that the aged ones should teach the younger ones good things. There are certain things that the sisters will show other sisters. But it says the most high have given us the tongue of the learned. It's in there. It just needs to be cultivated, right? It's kind of like uh, when you got like NFL or NBA prospects, they got the raw skills they tell you. They just need it to be honed and coached, right? This is how you, they'll call him a phenom because he, without that, he's been good. But just wait till he gets some real good guidance on how he do that. He's going to turn into something else, something special. He's a franchise player, whatever it is. It's the same thing when it comes to these scriptures, right? All ex except each and every one of us who have been preordained from the beginning, that's the part where we don't know, inherently has this within us if we apply the rest of this stuff that's been brought out today to cultivate it, to develop it, right? Read it again. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season. And you know how he gave us the tongue of the learned? Right here. He gave it to us. The tongue of the learned is here. We don't have to do anything else but make sure that we read and understand this the way it was meant to be understood, right? So he gave us the tongue of the learned. Come on. That I should speak a word in season to him that is weary. And this is what it means when I say somebody's sick or somebody's doing something. A word in season to them that are weary. So people are beat down by their problems. We're getting people that come in here with all types of issues, right? And they're trying to come out of it. They want answers, solutions. Come on. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. It says... Little by little, he brings this gift out in you. But Sirach 6, 32 through 37 has to be there first. You have to have the willing spirit. You have to have the ear that's bound down to it. And he says, little by little, he wakeneth. You're not going to become a great speaker overnight. He says, little by little, right? That's basically what he's saying. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. This is where we read in Sirach 6, where it said to bow down your ear, right? Come on, read on. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. None of you after this class should be rebellious against what came out. If it fits you, just apply it. Don't turn away back because you're going to mess yourself up. God has a purpose for all of us. Let him reveal it in due season. Stop trying to put yourself in positions that you may not be fit for. Wait on your ministry. Deacon Laba likes to say that, like, wait on your ministry, brothers and sisters. Wait on your ministry. All right? Don't rush to it. The Most High will give everybody as he sees fit. Right? Remember, with the diversities of gift, he says some of you is one thing. Some of us severally. He'll give out of abundance. Right? Uh, let me get James 1 and 26. We're almost done. A few more scriptures. The book of James, chapter 1 and verse 26. If any, man, if any man among you seem to be religious. And we're all religious, right? Because we keep these commandments, right? That's our religion. That's the Jews' religion is to keep the commandments, right? So if any among you seem to be religious. Remember how I said there's some of us who appear to be keeping the commandments. But there's seven abominations inside some of us, right? Come on. And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. You keeping all those commandments, if you can't bridle your tongue, you're deceiving your own mind because you won't let the Lord establish your own heart. It says, then your religion is vain. You're keeping these commandments in vain. You have to get it together when it comes to your speech and how you deal with it. And not just get it together, but you have to learn to be better at it. So, yeah, in the short term, the simple answer may be be quiet. But I'm going to put a little uh, emphasis on that and say, be quiet until you've wakened if morning by morning, right? And let yourself be opened up to be able to speak correctly. Let me get 1 Samuel 2 and 3. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 3. Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So we're going to see who of you 
actually let the Lord weigh your actions. I'm not going to know. I mean, in some respect, I might know the ones that I know are problematic with their speech if it's getting better. But in general, if any of this fits any of you, and trust me, it fits all of us, all right, to some extent, myself included, all right? It says, don't be so exceedingly proud. That goes back to what I said in the beginning. Have the humility to realize that you have an area that you need to work on, and speech is one that all of us need to, right? And let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. Shouldn't be like, oh, man, when captain's talking about, I know he wasn't talking about me because uh, I'm grown. I know how to talk to people. I'm talking to people all my life. Okay, that's the type of, that's the type of thing you're going to get, right? It says, because God is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The most high going to see it. At the end of the day, I've always told you, the worst that we can do is tell you leave and never come back here. It's the worst thing that I could do to you. I can't condemn your soul, none of that stuff. Nobody has that power except the most high, right? It was like what you were saying on the show today. People say, oh, only God can judge me. Only God can pass the judgment. Us who have knowledge and sit in a position the way we do, we can judge you. We all judge each other in one way or another. But there's only one power that can actually pass the, the judgment that's going to be the correct judgment on you, right? Which is that finality when the kingdom comes. Let's get Job 13 and 5. I got uh, three more scriptures. <clears throat> the book of Job, chapter 13 and verse 5. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace. And it should be your wisdom. Holding your peace is wisdom. Sometimes not saying anything is wisdom. Sometimes it's better to just shuff up. <laughs> right? That's a Hebrew word, shuff up. All right? If you're not sure what it is, look for somebody. I'm sure they'll be willing to explain it to you. <laughs> right? Sometimes it's better to shuff up. Hold your peace, the Bible says. Right? So rock 21 and 6. The book of Sirach, chapter 21 and verse 6. He that hateth to be reproved is in the way of sinners, but he that feareth the Lord will, rep will repent from his heart. Hey, and that's heavy because it says, it, it, it says that if you don't like correction, that in and of itself is a sin. And that's hard because nobody likes correction at first. That thing, you make the face when you get corrected, right? I spoke about that. You're like, yeah, you got the face. I mean, everybody's is different, but it's some semblance of that. It's like a variation of that, like, right? You feel your ears burning up. You feel everything getting right. And if you're real light-skinned like me, you might even see my ears burning up, right? But you feel the heat. Even if you can't see it, you feel the heat in the ears. Your face is tight. You mad as hell, right? But you better, you better let that thing simmer, marinate over you. You better... You just let that thing kind of coach your, coach your soul, coach your spirit, and, and let that thing seep in. Because it says if you hate correction, reproof is correction. If you hate correction, you are a sinner. To hate correction is a sin. You better learn to love it when you get corrected. Thank you, sir. May I have another? That's the spirit that we got to have, right? It's, hey, read it again. He that hateth to be reproved is in the way of sinners. But he that feareth the Lord will repent from his heart. And that's that godly sorrow, to repent from your heart. A brother earlier when we were talking about Jude mentioned something about how someone responds. You need to see if that repentance is sincere, right? Was there a sincere apology? Was there an acknowledgement of the sin, right? Or was it a begrudging thing, right? That they was just doing it because they don't want to be kicked out or whatever it is, whatever other consequence they thought it might be. So you have to learn to love that thing. Uh, jump to verse 11. Verse 11. He that keepeth the law of the Lord getteth the understanding thereof, and the perfection of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. The perfection of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. It says if you keep the law, you get the understanding thereof. You will get the understanding of proper speech, and again, all this revolves around what we read in Sirach 6, 32, all the way through 37, all right? You let God establish your heart. You let your mind be like that Godhead mentality. It says you will get the understanding, and perfecting that fear of the Lord is the wisdom. That's why I said we should be scared after this class 
and we should consider our speech more often. Right? Read verse 12. He that is not wise will not be taught. That means you're in the, you're in the way of sinners. You, if you will not be taught, you're in the way of sinners because not only is it a sin by that action, but remember when we read the scripture that said you lay up deceit within you? And then seven abominations is what's inside of you when you speak. You multiply evil inside of yourself. So it says, he that is not wise will not be taught. Come on. But there is a wisdom which multiplies bitterness. There is a wisdom which multiplies bitterness. Which wisdom is that? Think about what we read earlier in Proverbs 3 and 7, Romans 12, 16. Hold on, because you raised your hand too quick when I said that. That means I gave you the answer. Okay, but wait. Let me see if somebody else. Morty. Let's see Morty. Morty. Say shalom. Leadership. Most shalom. Christ so Christ that's your, your own wisdom, worldly wisdom. There you go. There's a wisdom which multiply of bitterness. Because that's wisdom too. The, your, your carnal wisdom, that's wisdom too. It's not righteous wisdom. It's not your wisdom in the sight of the nations like the scriptures say these commandments are. But that's wisdom, too. If you want to be wise in your own eyes, you want to continue on in your own way, and I'm going to talk how I'm going to talk, he ain't going to tell me how to talk. I ain't telling you how to talk at all. I'm telling you what God says how we should speak. So you ain't bucking up against me. You're bucking up against the Most High if you don't let this thing sink into your spirit and make the adjustments that you need to make. I pray y'all get some understanding with that, and don't be deceived with your own wisdom, all right? That thing multiplies bitterness. We used to scream black power. While Heron was pushed, but at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road. Purple and gold from Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are how our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.